Welcome to Global Catastrophic Wildfire Prevention Day recordings. On October 13th, 2021, we had speakers from more than 20 social innovation organizations from more than seven countries speak on how to prevent catastrophic wildfires. Thank you everybody for coming to this session. I think this is very important as we try to look at what are the nature-based solutions that we can deal with, with fire prevention and preparation and healing. How do we recover after fires um, in a much better and effective way? As just a little intro to this session, uh, my name is Hannah Apricot Eckberg. I am co-founder and executive director of the Abundant Earth Foundation. And we support permaculture and grassroots regenerative ag projects around the world. I grew up in Southern California during um, major drought and it was just part of life to really look at where every drop of water went. And it instilled in me a deep appreciation for water and how our land deals with water and drought and fires. And um, also made me think about the energy that we use to move water and how we manipulate the natural water systems to accommodate our cities and um, different lifestyles that we've become accustomed to that don't fit with how nature and the world works. In 2009, during an unusually hot day in May, I lost my home in what was the third fire in over a year in the Santa Barbara area. And experiencing this total devastation and a loss of pretty much everything I owned really gave me a, a deep feeling for the complete devastation that fires can cause and how quite often the landscape can recover even faster than, um, than people do emotionally. And so it's... Uh, been really devastating now over the, the last 10 years, having many more friends lose their homes and seeing many communities completely wiped out by fire. And so this really gives us both an opportunity to be the phoenix and to rise from this devastation, but to really take pause to ask, what are some of the nature-based solutions and how can permaculture and regenerative agricultural practices make us more resilient to fire and other climate change aspects that we're dealing with? And how can we learn from nature and mimic it and apply these approaches to our societies? Things like, saving the forest and planting more trees, having beavers return and installing ponds and different water catchments. How can we increase the organic carbon in soil so that it is more moist and able to deal with the fires and recover better? How can we strengthen the mycelium network that is so important to the soil's health? What are the conditions conducive to life and nature that we can start to apply so that as we look at things like fires, we are truly more creative and more resilient in our approaches, especially as we look and try to recover from fires afterwards. 
So how can we apply these rapidly and spread them to the rest of the world as these issues become more and more prominent at a global scale? And so this is a conversation that my dear friend Alpha Lowe and I started having back in July when we reconnected at a party in Southern California and just really talking about the importance of water and natural solutions to fires. And how can we fund this and spread the education? And so we've been looking at the concept of water credits instead of carbon credits. How can cryptocurrency and NFTs be used to fund projects that are rehydrating the planet? How can we bring together leading experts to really put together a list of what are the best practices and how can other people apply these around the world? And so we've been uh, hosting meetings uh, through the Water Coalition that we've started. We're going to be working with the Open Future Coalition with Jamaica Stevens and others. And we'll hear about that a little bit later in the call and participating in conversations like this. And so I'm very excited today to bring forth three experts that will each give a brief presentation and then we'll open it up for more of an open discussion afterwards in our remaining time. Um, and so without any further ado, I also want to invite you, if you're interested in keeping up in this work uh, and on our newsletter and website that's gonna be coming and our, we host once a month calls with people who are interested in rehydrating the planet from natural solutions. Um, please feel free to put your email in the chat or you can private message me in the chat as well with your email so that we can sign you up on our email list and let you know of those upcoming meetings. Um, so with that introduction, I also just want to thank Bobby and Claudia and everybody else who has helped organize this amazing conference throughout the day. And again, welcome all of you to this session looking at natural solutions to um, dealing with fire. So it gives me great honor to introduce our first speaker. He has been a dear friend, a mentor and permaculture guru and uh, beaver extraordinaire, just dear friend, Brock Dolman, who's co-founder of the Sewing Circle um, at the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, where he directs permaculture programs and the Water Institute. I encourage you to check out oaecwater.org for more information. He's up in Sonoma County, which has definitely been experiencing it's uh, wildfires. He's a professional wildlife biologist, restoration ecologist, and keynote speaker at many, many different presentations, including the International Permaculture Convergence in Cuba, which was a great time, um, throughout Spain, Zambia, at Bioneers. The list goes on and on. He uh, was featured in the 11th hour, the movie by Leonardo DiCaprio. And I will put a link in uh, the chat for one of his TED Talks. He works with the Sonoma County Fish and Wildlife Commission and has just done so much to really help emphasize the importance of beaver and other natural solution to our water problems. And so Brock, thank you so much for joining us here today. Wow. Well, thank you, Hannah, and nice to see you in that little box down there in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, nice to see others of you all on the call today. So I'm going to go ahead and share screen and cut to the chase on thumbs up from folks. Is that working? People see that? Yeah? Great. Yes, we got you. OK, well. Yeah, with the, uh, Han asked if I'd do a little bit of a presentation and then stay around for the panel. So I'll just get into it. Um, so I, I do live and work in Western Sonoma County and at the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center and, and Hannah 
provided a link or mentioned that link, I can provide links. You can check it out. And one of the programs I co-direct with Kate Lundquist in the photos here is our Water Institute. And I'm not gonna talk a lot about the background of Water Institute, but a lot of the things I will talk about are the kinds of projects and, and initiatives that we've been involved with for the last, OEC has been here, it's our 27th year and it's actually an 80 acre property that I co-purchased back in 1994 and now co-own with nine other people as a, a consensus-based intentional community that we all live on the property and share everything equally for going on almost 30 years now. So, um, and I do wanna just acknowledge and start off with recognizing the uh, First Nations and the peoples of this place here who are the Southern Pomo and the Coast Miwok and the Kashaya Pomo. And I see myself personally having multiple decades of very explicit direct reverential relations with, the, with our, our tribal communities here who are known uh, as the Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria if people wanna look them up. So just honoring the, that connection. Um, a little bit of context here just to get into it, which makes um, is helpful is I live in the Russian River Basin. It's a 1500 square mile basin that drains through Mendocino County and Sonoma County and uh, meets its beginning or end, depending on which way you're going with the ocean at a little town called Jenner. And then in the lower right there, I actually live in a sub tributary of the Russian River Basin, the lower Russian River called the Dutch Bill Creek watershed. And then OAC, if you see that arrow, is all the way up in the tippy tippy top of that system. So we are truly, our property is a headwaters um, piece of land or an upland piece of land. Even though every, all of our property drains and the fires that would burn here drain to coho salmon spawning areas, steelhead trout areas. And I like to think of watersheds as what I call basins of relations. And then the opportunity here is really to rethink from the ridge to the river to the reef, what is that reverential and resilient and rehydration revolution retrofit? And every land use from the headwaters to the upslopes, to the floodplains, to the estuaries, to the deltas, urban, rural, suburban, forestry, rangeland, agriculture, each land use, each human settlement has its own portfolio of resilience strategies, resiliency for fire, resiliency for water, resiliency for carbon, resiliency for life. As Jeanine Benyus would say, how do we create conditions conducive for life and energy flows and matter cycles and life webs. And that's really us re-engaging in those cycles, or I, I would articulate that regeneration or sustainability is about our ability to sustain the cycles of life. And fire is one of those big cycles. And I'm glad to see Mikkel Kravchik on the call today. That's, I was not aware of that. So I, this isn't me pandering to Mikkel. <laughs> but, uh, and you can see Mikkel, he was visiting at OAC a number of years ago. And we were talking about the small water cycle and some of the work that um, we've been doing at OAC over the years and, and the connections with the work he has been doing and continues to do and, and the Rain for Climate Initiative. So I'm, just honoring at some level the, the big idea of the, of the small water cycle, which I think a lot of the work we do fits within that conceptual and pragmatic framework. Um, and I'm gonna skip, it's kind of skip stones on deep water, if you will. So I'm gonna offer you just resources and links and ideas for you all to go find later. So here's a, a booklet that I co-wrote with Kate Lundquist a bunch of years ago. It's his third edition called Basins of Relations, Citizen's Guide to Protecting and Restoring Watersheds. And you might find that of interest. It's full of information and context and, and resources at different levels. Um, really think about this idea of the fact that you live on planet water. You don't live on planet Earth. And it's the only known place in the universe where life is endemic, meaning it occurs only here. And I'm up for meeting an extraterrestrial, bring it on. But at this point, as a biologist, I darn well know this life is loaded with life. This planet is loaded with life. And I'm all about that. So um, let's see here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I've been working in the water space, if you will, for 30 years and done a lot with what is called stormwater management. And so many years ago, and maybe some of you've heard this phrase that I coined and is now spread all over, um, this idea of slow it, spread it, sink it, store it, and ultimately share it. 
with respect to how we relate to water so that we live in a, a space where instead of the drain age, the age of draining everything, which has been a Euro settler capitalist imposition on our watersheds, the drain age, the dehydration, desiccation, degradation age, we really need to move into the retain age and the retaining um, part of this. And here's another wonderful booklet that really drills down to a watershed scale a suite of suggestions around our attempt in the Dutchville Creek to optimize stream flows for the recovery of coho salmon and steelhead. And so how do we think like a watershed? And, and, and I've been involved with many, many partners, agency partners, federal, state, universities, nonprofits, um, RCDs on this. And so this document may be really interesting to folks here. You can find it online if you search that. Um, name. A couple papers that you also may be interested in, either a peer-reviewed paper I did with Dr. Matt Deitch a bunch of years ago with a really long title about restoring summer base flows in Mediterranean climates, or more of a thought piece around this idea of welcome to planet water uh, for the Center for Humans and Nature's journal. Here's a wonderful little case study we did around resiliency at a community scale, which is in the small town of Bodega, which is in Western Sonoma County, which is inland, not Bodega Bay on the coast, where we did a whole community-based roof water harvesting for resiliency. So the, the fire, the volunteer fire department has a 40,000 gallon tank. All the homes have five to 20,000 gallons of roof water storage. And the three big dairies in the area all have various roof water tanks from 240,000 gallons to 1.8 million gallons. And all of that is about storing winter runoff for reuse to get all of their these pumps out of the stream to augment in-stream flows for fisheries and improve resiliency from a water perspective. And then recently, as a biologist, we've been OAC has been organizing around this idea of rewilding, and we're talking a lot about rewilding species, whether that's beavers and condor and elk and wolves and pronghorn and salmon. And so we hosted a, an online convening, and I did a talk for that that you can find on YouTube if you look this up that you might find interesting because a lot of the way I'm promoting how we think about this is really beginning to think about process-based restoration, really thinking like verbs and less about nouns. It's about flows, it's about process, it's about time and space, it's about frequency and intensity. Um, and that has to do with water and drought, it has to do with fire. The, um, and the frequency and intensity of these verbs as they flow through our, our world and how do we interact with them? Are we regenerative process-based folks? Are we degenerative? Are we in a regenerative relationship or a degenerative relationship? And then just continuing to drill the fractal down, if you will, here's a um, document that we created called the Wildland Stewardship Plan. It's 200 pages of a very deep dive into the 80-acre parcel here and our assessment, our analysis, the existing conditions, and then our proposal for various applications of restoration of earth, air, fire, water, life on this 80 acre parcel. So again, I, I we like um, appreciate thinking big and conceptually, but we're also, there's the TIY, think it yourself, and then there's the DIY, do it yourself. And we, as a good permaculture designer, you have to have the bandwidth to scale from micro to macro and be what I would call a specialized generalist. We started using fire in a prescribed way here at OAC. This is the first burn we did back in 1997. Um, as Hannah said, Sonoma County in the last number of years, we've had really intense, significant conflagrations. Um, and so trying to find a right relationship with fire is a really interesting conundrum. I live in an area that was entirely clear cut in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. It's been cut multiple times on the third and fourth growth system here. And then we've had fire suppression, which then kept fire out, which then allowed certain vegetation to grow at levels of densities that are catastrophic for conflagrations. So this was a project back in the early 2000s with the Marine Conservation Corps, where if you look at this image, you'll see these youth are thinning and limbing Douglas fir a native tree, and if you see those oaks in the upper left there, we thinned and limbed that, and then used all that biomass in this area where we have a deeply incised gully that's been eroding and delivering sediment to the salmon stream below and killing the salmon spawning grounds 
So we're using the fire and the fuel load of the fire suppressed post clear cut vegetation to strategically place it in the waterways to slow and spread and sink and store water and carbon and increase groundwater recharge and improve the forest health up on the slope and the uh, vitality of the system. So problems into solutions. And so our mantra here has really been about what I would call fewer trees and more forest and forest as a verb instead of trees as nouns, as individuated things. And so really thinking about balance and equilibrium and stocking densities and, and reutilization of all that amazing carbon, that solar energy that's been stored in, in wood, in leaves and, and reutilizing that. And so here's an article I wrote for the California Native Plant Society some years ago called Mending the Wild. It's riffing off the title of an incredible book I would recommend by Kat Anderson called Tending the Wild about California Native American environmental land management. But we're at the point where we're trying to mend to get back to the tend <laughs> because we're making up for 150 years of uh, extraction and exploitation. And so this is a really interesting article that was mainly focused on um, certain kinds of edible geophytes and plants that had roots that have a long history since time immemorial with indigenous peoples here and about processes such as the utilization of fire, regenerative relationships. Um, and then uh, just to cut to the chase, we're also engaged in getting public funds through this recent program here, the North Bay Forest Improvement Program so that we now have um, 76,000 bucks and we're gonna limb and thin 41 acres of the property over the next couple of years with different treatment types. And we're engaged with multiple folks. We just had a, a class from the Santa Rosa Junior College come out and this was their final project for the end of the class. So instead of a written exam, they came to be out with us for the day. That's $10,000 worth of new tools that we bought because our barn burned down, not, not a wildfire, but in March of 2020, we lost all our wildland tools. So I feel a piece of Hannah's pain about losing so much to fire. Um, so we, we literally retooled and we've been out in the woods and we work a lot with groups and hands-on projects and DIY and we're teaching folks how to do this work in a pragmatic way while we're actually getting the work done. In this case, limbing and thinning Douglas fir where it's encroaching into native oak woodland. Um, and then all that slash to us is not trash, it's a beneficial biomass. And so, um, boy, I realized that I've, I've had you guys on, I should have put this on this show so you'd see it better. So here's the oak woodland encroachment project that we did in Mendocino County where we thinned and limbed Douglas fir on behalf of multi hundred year oaks. And then we went to this very deeply incised eroding gully and we used all that biomass. And this was done with a group called Terra, the Tribal Eco Restoration Alliance, which are POMO peoples who are trained to do this work and they're doing it as on a contract basis. So yeah, our mantra is slash is not trash, it's beneficial biomass. And we're fulfilling, literally fully filling these gullies with fur real food and reutilizing and all that organic matter. Then when water comes, it captures the nutrients and the bed load and the fine particles and the organic matter and the clays. And it fills in and makes a compost pile that absorbs and holds six to 10 times its weight in water as a sponge of carbon sequestration from greenhouse gas um, um, held up organic matter that then the tree roots or the adjacent plants, the, the chaparral and perennial bunch grasses can grow into. And now we have a groundwater recharging sediment sequestering um, living carbon sponge while we've also have a fire resilient uplands with an oak woodland that is happier and healthier. To do that gully stuffing, it requires permits. And so we legally just acquired our permits. We had to go to the regional board, our North Coast Water Board and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and actually get formal permits to place this slash, which is considered a hazardous material into these gullies in a strategic way within certain parameters. And I won't go down the details of the permitting, but we're legalizing gully stuffing and reutilization here. <laughs> And we've been doing this for a long time for what it's worth. This is a gully, we, a project with permaculture students back in the late 90s, 2000s, where we're using invasive scotch broom when it doesn't have seeds and placing it in this head cut gully to mitigate the sediment delivery and the erosion and increase recharge. And this is a finished gully project we did with, again, um, invasive French broom and scotch broom here 
to mitigate the channel incision, which is a legacy impact from the clear cutting days. And again, do all of those multiple functions. So we're really interested in resiliency as relational projects and stacking functions. And then just a couple things I could not talk about beavers. I would recommend you go download our free publication on the left, Beaver in California. And I would highly recommend you read Ben Goldfarb's wonderful book called Eager, if you want to get into this world of beavers. And I love this image that it came out of King County in Washington about the small water cycle with respect to beavers and the, the rehydration of landscapes by beavers and all of the work that beavers do and their connectivity to this concept of rehydrating small water cycles through, through beaver restoration. And there's a lot of focus on beavers now, both during the drought because of the water holding they do, the water cleansing they do, the biofiltration, their riparian systems, the recharge, but also what is now known as a uh, Smokey the beaver. And this is an amazing uh, image of a fire in Idaho in 2018 where everything burned except for the beaver wetland. And that's where the wildlife went and that's the resilient zone that remains. And so Dr. Emily Fairfax in California has written a, a publication, a peer reviewed scientific publication called Smokey the Beaver that's doing remote sensing, looking at pre and post Google Earth imagery on fires and where beavers were or not. Really interesting. And because beaver are interacting in the fluvial geomorphology, sediment, bed load, water, wildlife interface, they're keystone species, and we should honor them as that. And if you really want to dive into it, a number of us co-hosted California's first ever Beaver Summit back in April, and all of the recordings are online, and there's just an amazing number of speakers that you could go, go look at there. And until the grizzly bears brought back to California, we replaced the bear on the California flag with the beaver. And so the beaver flag revolt commences here in Sonoma County. And um, ultimately, I just wanna leave you with this idea what I call conservation hydrology, which is how do we adapt our water footprint? I and mean, you could say our fire footprint to be regenerative and rehydrative. How do we receive and recharge and retain and release in a reverential retrofit that keeps the watershed clear and cold and copious for coho? while we also have a regenerative relationship with fire where its return interval with fire has a high frequency with a low intensity, much like it did in um, Native American indigenous burning days. And so I think with that, that is my time and I'm gonna give it back to Hannah and stop sharing. There you have it. Thank you so much, Brock. It's always so interesting and you're one of my favorite wordsmiths. So <laughs> it really helps uh, give a good perspective when we start to dissect the meanings of words and how they all relate and that permaculture perspective of everything really connected. And that, yeah, certainly there is no waste in nature. Uh, so thank you. And so that we can allow time for some discussion at the end of this, I do want to move on to introduce our next guest speaker. Um, Peter Gabris is a hydrologist and also a computer scientist involved in modeling of rainfall runoff relations and the water dynamics and the natural cycles. Um, in the late 70s, he became a UNDP expert and helped create flood forecasting and warning systems for the Indus River, which are still in operation. He's published numerous books, and um, rather than taking time to retire, he spends his time helping people and water and working on nonprofit organizations that are addressing these issues. So, Peter, we're very excited to have you join us here today. Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction. Now, let me try to share my screen. And uh, after Brock's speech, I'm afraid I'm going to uh, Can you see my screen? Not yet. Um, do you see at the bottom where it says share screen? That should. Oh, yeah. There should be a little green button and an arrow. So it's share yes, screen. I do. I Wonderful. Do. I do. Mm -hmm. Now. 
You need to confirm, Peter. What do you want to show? Yes. How about now? Still not. No. Yeah. You may need to click on your um, desktop of the screen you want it to see. Uh, oh. Is that, uh, there we go? Yes, yeah, perfect. Much now. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to move you out. So is it now sharing well? No, it's still showing yes. me. Uh, no, we, we, we see your screen. You're all set to go. Good, good. So this is High Tatras mountain range. It's a beautiful place, Alpine Luke. We used to hike it with my dad. Uh, all those uh, peaks on it, there's just something like uh, 6,500 uh, feet above the sea level. So not, not really so big peak, at least it looks like, and the whole area is about 100 square miles. All of that uh, used to be beautiful resort. Those uh, lovely, lovely forests you see, they are replacement for the original natural forest which was growing there and uh, was cut for various purposes, grazing one of them. And then this spruce was replanted to stress the alpine look of the whole thing and uh, was loved by everybody but it was also a uh, fire risk and uh, uh, environmentally very unstable and think and distant out to be source of the catastrophe that came in 2004 uh, Hurricane-like uh, winds came in the winter, and this is what happened with almost half of the whole area of forest there. To add what insult to the injury, a few months after the hurricane, the Broken forest there got fire. Fire also caught a little bit of uh, forest that survived uh, the damage itself. And the whole nation was just sad because, well, this, this mountain range is on the border between uh, Slovakia and Poland and loved by both countries and both nations and now the most beautiful places were gone and everybody was immediately smart what to do with it. Now, we under, everybody understood that there is a risk of erosion of bark beetle uh, spreading out of, uh, of this area and uh, loss of recreation lose, uh, use practically all the all the area, all those resorts uh, losing business for one generation. Local forestry wanted to clear the area and plant new forests. Traditional methods. Now, environmentalists went uh, directly opposite way. Let's the forest heal. It will grow again. It will grow in a natural way the forest itself will find the optimal mixture of plants and so on. Now, people and water, which, uh, which was already established in that time and we, whose father we have here, and I will badmouth him in a few minutes, uh, they suggested to to do measures to retain the rainfall in place. And uh, 
they were arguing that moisture will heal the area. Luckily, uh, 205 acres area was put aside uh, for them to test the whole approach. Uh, so 140 volunteers came the next summer. They came, not all of them for the whole summer. They were, were taking turns and there were camps and they were doing uh, those uh, rain retention measures using just scrap wood and local materials used because forestry insisted on taking uh, timber that was possible to sell and, uh, and people and water agreed to the deal. So those, we have a few pictures from works uh, done. As you see, if, if you do those measures, you use everything that's available. Remnants of the tree, scrap wood, uh, soil, stones, you know, holes after uh, uprooted trees, and, and all that is going to help retain the rain on the spot where it falls down. Uh, the, on, he, here you can see that uh, erosion was already starting. It, it is starting very, very fast, but uh, you not only react to erosion the way that you, you concentrate your, your water retention measures there, but you take a guidance from the water. You watch where the water wants to flow and uh, you address those spots first. So after work like this, uh, the results were not immediately visible. You can see a little bit few uh, trees there. Those were planted. Those were planted, that was also uh, under suggestion and activity of the owner of the area, uh, not believing that there is enough seed uh, for the forest to grow, grow itself. And the people and water, their influence was uh, to push for a good mixture of, uh, of those planted trees especially to get uh, pioneer trees there. But what you can see from this picture is that the nature took, uh, took those measures for its own. The, the whole area looked naturally and pretty nice right very short time after, after the intervention. Now, totally different look at the area is after a few years. Uh, you, can, you can see that all that work was worth, worth it. The biodiversity that uh, retained water brought in is impressive if you, if you visit the area still today. 16 years from works done there. And two years after that, uh, people behind the whole activity and thinking put all the idea together and published the book, New Water Paradigm. For those who still do not have them, here is the download link for the English version. And uh, the, book, the book is interesting from the point of view, they call the term small water cycle. Uh, and uh, explain it in this well-known picture. Now, 
who wants me to go through the details here? I believe that this uh, whole thing is well known to everybody here. If it is not, let's leave it for the discussion. And here is another another picture from the book, which uh, I won't go to details either. It is generally showing that. Uh, oh, let's go back. Yeah. Without energy from the sun, the land, which we call dry land, would really be dried. By the gravitation, all the water would sooner or later end up in ocean. So what we call now a problem, a cause of uh, global heating and so on, it's a source of all water on on. Uh, on the land and on necessary for all life outside of ocean. So we do we do not need to complain about the energy. We need just to look how the energy is used. If there is enough moisture in the region, most of the energy is used to grow the biomaterial and keep the loop running. Just once we remove the forest, we, we, we remove native grass, we turn there just monocultures or things like that, then a lot of energy is turning into sensible heat. After those 15 years from publishing uh, New Water Paradigm, uh, Michael Kravchik got into publishing mood again, and he wrote a chapter for Handbook of Climate Change Management, published this year by Springer. And uh, to read it, you need a Springer open access. There is no free download. However, as I checked, most libraries do have that. So go on, please have a look. The whole thing is written from practical point of view. Here is, uh, are just two examples of pictures of uh, uh, water retention measures in the country. So much for, for advertising here. Now, few words about other approaches, other approaches to forest restoration. Planting trees, it is costly. The reaction time, it takes years. Success depends on the rain anyway. When we compare the forest restored 16 years ago, we had on pictures, with the forest that was restored by traditional forestry and also with the for uh, with the area that was uh, led for the forest to recover on both you see dry spots you do not see dry spots where the water was used to restore uh, to restore the forest moreover uh, since people and water did uh, multiple projects after, we learned that planting trees is uh, really not necessary. There is always enough uh, uh, seeds in the, in the soil. There, there is always enough seeds brought in by animals or wind. The forest really grows if there is enough water. Now, grazing and browsing, uh, animals to, to change the shape of the forest and to protect the forest against uh, uh, fires. Yes, by all means, but it requires the uh, uh, animal management, which is not easy, regardless if it, it, if it is wild animals or agricultural activity. It requires a social acceptance because uh, because of people are people. And anyway, 
again, you need water. Now, regenerative agriculture, no-till, and all those activities, yes, by all means. They are doing on the agricultural land the same thing we argue here to do in the forest. So wherever we can increase the organic contents in the soil, we are doing a very useful thing. Uh, rewilding rivers, water courses, creating uh, wetlands, yes. Yes, all of that, all, all of that is slowing down the runoff. So. And Peter, I, I hate to do this, but we are limited on time. Oh, perfect. Okay, I wanted to see how people can follow up with you and get more information. So yes, thank you. Exactly. Excellent. Um, yeah, yes. any part yeah, of this? Yes. I'm searching where to stop sharing. That's all. Okay, I was all able to pause it. I believe you can now take it from me. Okay, I'll, we'll take over, yeah. <laughs> Trying to get back to everybody because we um, certainly want to return now um, to Alpha Low, my co-founder uh, in the Water Coalition, as this is just a, a very flowing um, uh, organization that very, not even an organization, just calling forth those who are called to help rehydrate the planet and to bring our talents and information together. Um, and so let's see, Peter, I am trying to uh, stop sharing your screen. There we go. Okay, great. Um, so yes, uh, as usual, time flies by in these conversations. And so um, I did put in the chat a link for a meeting next Thursday that we will have for the Water Coalition at 10 a.m. Pacific time. And um, please invite you to join there to continue this discussion and any questions that you have and thoughts. Um, I wanna give Alpha a few minutes and then hopefully we will still have a little bit of time for discussions or direct questions. Also feel free to put them in the chat and I hope to give Jamaica a few minutes so that she can tell people about the new platform, the Open Future um, Coalition, where we will be convening and sharing information and helping to track these best practices and efforts around the world. Um, so Alpha, it's been really exciting, the different work that you're working on to help gather all of this information around the world and looking at instead of project drawdown, how about a project water and rehydrate this planet? And so um, let's see, Alpha is um, a physicist who's done a lot of research in complex systems and in the phase transitions of water. He's done work in eco-social design and is author and editor of the Open Collaborative Encyclopedia um, and now working with me with the Water Coalition and also helps run some Facebook groups that are addressing these issues as well that hopefully we can put in the chat. And I do encourage you all to um, download the chat also to get all of these valuable um, links and everything that's been shared. So with that, Alpha, please take it away. Okay, hello everyone, it's great to be here. Um, can you just allow me to share my um, slides? You should be able to. Oh. Uh, share screen button down at the bottom. Okay, got it. Okay, is that appearing? Yes. Oh, oops, I gotta go all the way back. Okay, cool. So I'm going to talk a bit about restoring the rain today. And um, so 
if we have more rains, then hopefully we'll slow down some of the wildfires. So, um, yeah, so, and I'm newer to this area than uh, Brock Dolman and Peter Gabris and Michael Kravich. And so, uh, yeah, I'll just share some of my perspectives um, coming into this. Um, so under certain conditions, if there's enough uh, water vapor in the air, it will turn into rain. And um, vegetation transpires water vapor and the soil also evaporates water vapor into the air. So therefore, vegeta vegetation and soil can impact rainfall that way. And it's a, it's a simple enough idea, but uh, it seems like it's kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's not, people are not aware of that as possibly as they maybe could be. Trying to see how I'd get to it. So um, there's a lot of different air, different places that have had experience of uh, bringing back the rain. So in the lowest plain in China, a desert the size of Belgium was restored to growth. Um, and this happened because they helped the goats and sheep to stop eating all the vegetation. Terraces and berms were built to catch the rainfall and a large replanting process has happened. And, um, and over uh, many years, a rain has come back to that region. Um, in Al Baidra, in the desert area in Saudi Arabia, they used different techniques, permaculture techniques to catch the rainwater. And so that hydrated the uh, plants. And because the atmosphere was constrained by the mountains, when the water vapor was transpired in the air, it kind of stayed in that area. So it could allow the rain to then fall back and create the small water cycle. And they also used trees to block the rain, the wind to kind of trap that water vapor. Um, in the Mediterranean, uh, the meteorologist Milan Milan studied the impact of rainfall on land. And he noticed that as more of the nature was converted to urban lands, there was a loss of rain. And so the reverse process can also happen as we uh, reforest or re-nature uh, the urban areas, we could actually also bring back rainfall. Um, in Borneo, Willie Smith's led a restoration effort that planned about four square miles of uh, forest and that increased the rain uh, 20 plus percentages and clouds covers 20, 10 plus percentage. Um, that's a very humid area um, there. In the Amazon, um, they looked at the water isotopes and uh, the water isotopes showed that the water was coming from the trees rather than the oceans just before it started raining, which indicated that the trees were creating rain and it's not just the water from the oceans that are creating the rain. Hang on, I'm going to Hang on one sec. I'm just going to move a little bit. I'm sorry. I'm in a little bit of a noisy area. Um, in Nebraska, um, the cornfields cover about 25% of the state and the winds are high and uh, there. And so it blows the water vapor around, but still the corns have increased the rain by 30% there. Um, in Central Valley, California, uh, the aquifer has been draining the water a lot um, to feed a lot of the US. But um, while California has decreased the rainfall in the Central Valley, it looks like the, um, the rainfall has been pretty constant. So the crop transpiration may have played a role in creating some rain. <clears throat> um, in California and Israel, air pollution has led to a decrease, 15 to 25% decrease in rain downwind. So the, the air pollution creates um, small particles for the water vapor to create small um, kind of smaller condensation particles. So it kind of isn't big enough to actually create rainfall. And so that's the reason why. So there's um, a vegetation, soil, groundwater, rain feedback loop. And in the research literature, there's, there's discussion of the soil moisture precipitation couplings, the groundwater precipitation couplings and the vegetation soil couplings. And so, and the vegetation precipitation couplings. So, there's all sorts of indication, there's all sorts of feedback loops between these things. And so if we work with these feedback loops, we can increase the rain. Um, and so these feedback loops include the small water cycle where the rain goes to the soil and then to the plants and then back up to the clouds and to create rain. And it also includes the rainfall falling to go to the rivers that then overflow into the floodplains and river banks to go into the trees there and then flow back up. And they, that can be for hundreds of miles this flow. <clears throat> um, and there's different feedback loops. So drought conditions can actually create worse drought conditions because you create drier soil, 
which then have more plants dying, which means that the even drier soil, which can't absorb the rainfall, which means you can't have the plants growing to transpire the rain back, uh, the water back up. So it's a, it's, a, it's a problematical feedback loop. But if you can get to the tipping point where you're actually creating, you could bring back the rain by creating more wet soil, more microbes, which then allow the soil to have more air pockets, which can then absorb more water, which can then grow more plants, which then has more dead biomass to increase the soil uh, absorbency, which then leads to more transpiration and more rain. And so you can actually, so there's different um, attractor points in dynamical systems theory um, or metastable points um, in, in thermodynamics. So we're trying to get them to the healthier um, uh, attractor points in the system. So the key factor is increasing rain, uh, the ability of soils to absorb the rainfall. And you can do this by increasing the soil sponginess. And then also there's different uh, permaculture techniques like swales and ponds and dead branches to divert the rainfall into the soil. Um, and then the amount of plants that transpire water vapor um, and, and that, which also cool the earth and the water condenses more easily at lower temperatures. Um, another factor is where the water and the soil flows. So the river banks and the floodplains where the oil water goes to those areas, they feed the plants there and then transpires back up to the, um, to create rain. Um, aerosols are also an important uh, factor. The whole aerosol climate um, cloud feedback loops is a little bit um, still debated in the research literature. So while aerosols help seed the rain, they also reflect more solar radiation, which um, can sometimes increase the temperature, which lowers the rainfall. So under certain conditions, it increases rainfall and others it, others it doesn't. Um, another key factor is amount of water that we divert to big cities from rural areas, because um, say in LA, if you divert a lot of water from Owens Valley and up north, then those areas get less hydrated and those that hydration could be bringing the ecosystem, which then transpires water in the air, which creates rain. Um, so the floodplains are an important area. Um, so if we have, uh, there's like 1500 dams in California and a lot of the dams are stopping the ebb and flow of the water, which can, which would normally overflow into the floodplains, but because the dams hold the water, it doesn't happen. And so all that ecosystem that could be um, fertilized is not. And, um, and also helping with this is beavers, which build little weirs that help um, the water divert from the river into the floodplains. Um, and so one of the ways we can actually help with the um, diversion of all the water uh, to LA is to make LA itself a small water cycle. So in Burbank, they depaved a lot of concrete and building wetlands, which allows the rainwaters to seep into the, into the land, clean it, and then go into the aquifers. And the plan in LA is to then build wells to bring up the water to feed its inhabitants. So if LA provides its own small water cycle, then we're gonna drain less water from else places. So creating these kind of sponge cities is kind of key too, to uh, restoring the rain. So one of the projects we're trying to launch here is to kind of create the project drawdown for the water cycle. So project drawdown was a list of the top 100 methods to draw down carbon um, to help with climate change. But perhaps even more important than the carbon cycle is the water cycle. So we'd like to create and bring together a lot of experts, like hopefully um, different, uh, different people in different areas of this, from the permaculturist to the meteorologist, to the scientist, to the agroecologist, um, uh, so forth. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly just touch on some of this list. Um, there's different methods. So uh, there's the plant, matter, fungi, bacteria, methodology. So basically planting more vegetation um, has multiple benefits. It, it's, it's what helps evaporate the water in the sky. It's what helps guide the water into the soil. It, it provides the biomass for the microbes to eat and, um, and the mi microbes multiply to create the soil. Um, mycelia can help funnel water to different plants within the soil. Um, the dead biomass uh, is useful to create healthier soils and placing dead branches and leaves in the path of down, downhill rainfall helps guide it into the soil. Um, in certain areas, the plants are drawing up too much water and that throws off the ecosystem there. So you can replace almonds, salt, cedar, various things with less uh, water hungry uh, plants. 
And then there's also organic matter in the sky. There's certain bacteria, fungi, pollen that's in the sky that can help seed rain. Um, and it's debated how much significance that has actually. Um, so also uh, we want to create healthy soils through this various permaculture, agroecology, regenerative agriculture techniques from crop rotation, mulching, non-tilling, mycelia, compost teas, worm farming, animal poop, biodigesters, reusing sediment from one area for another. So um, those are good techniques. And so a lot of people doing say permaculture and agroecology are not always aware, but they actually are influenced in the climate and the weather cycles. Um, there's a lot of earthworks things that you can do from swales, weirs, small ponds, terracing, key line systems, rocks, guiding downhill rainfall to seep into the ground. So um, those techniques. Um, and there's en animal engineers from beavers and prairie dogs, which are loosening, loosening up the soil to cattle, which uh, help push the vegetation in the soil and also help the soil become more absorbent, earthworms, mussels, which clean the water systems, dung beetles, wild donkeys. Um, and then the man-made structures are also real important. Um, we want to undo some of these structures. So there's dams we can undo that help water flow into the floodplains, uh, take down concrete riverbanks. Hydropower stations potentially weaken the water velocity, which then calves the river arcs. Um, Depaving parking lots and roads and putting and rewilding them would then help. Um, and unpiping some of these water structures that are transporting water to cities um, and then getting the cities to have small water cycles themselves. Um, there's certain structures that help in the, in the water system, gray water, fog nets, rain barrows. And then there's all sorts of urban stuff we can do from uh, uh, green rooftops, community food forests. I won't go through all that whole list. Um, I think the big one is to create wetlands in our cities that, or to create sponge cities that um, absorbing a lot of the rainfall that we can also then uh, create the small water cycle. Um, and then in the sewage system, um, if we can kind of uncouple the sewage from the water system. And so that can also be very helpful. And there's all sorts of techniques there. And then we want to restore um, a lot of these areas from the wetlands to the coastal systems and so forth. And uh, Alf, I hate yes. to do this, but we are at time for this session, unfortunately. Okay, so let me uh, just uh, put the info, yeah, the last yeah. slide then. So just the, so if you want more information, I just started a climate permaculture newsletter. So it's on the Substack. Um, we're building out a website, the Climate Water Project um, website. We have a monthly water coalition call that I think Hannah gave you the link to. And uh, yeah, we're looking for people to work on this climate water project, which is kind of the project drawdown um, and uh, the look at the principles of water, rain restoration. We're creating a network of watershed wisdom councils that are local. And that's my email and Twitter. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, sorry, we didn't have time, of course, to go into lots of details there. Sorry, now I'm in a loud place. <laughs> um, I do want to respect everybody's time. Uh, I'm sorry we did not have more time for Q&A and open discussion. But yes, if you can uh, join us next Thursday, I put the chat in again for our Water Coalition meeting. And maybe some of our speakers can join us as well then at 10 AM Pacific time. Um, and Jamaica just posted again in the chat a link for the Open Future Coalition, where we will have an online platform to be looking at this. Because as the world is changing so quickly due to climate change, I really feel we have a chance to be more resilient, to try to stave off some of the, um, the disasters that, that otherwise we will be facing. And everybody can be part of the solution. And that's really the main thing. Uh, and so I hope today that you found some little ways that you can help to apply nature's wisdom and uh, be part of help rehydrating the planet. And thank you, Brock, Peter, Alpha, really appreciate your time and your wisdom and your many years of dedication to this. And Bobby and Claudia, thank you so much for hosting this amazing conference. I know the rest of the talks are back on um, a, a different platform. So please download the chat if you'd like, reach out to me directly or Alpha. 
Um, and I'm sorry to have to cut it off, but I know there's uh, some more exciting talks this afternoon that you'll want to join. So with that, I will uh, say thank you so much to everybody. If there's one last word that anybody wants to get in, you can uh, go, but we are at time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if you don't know how to download the chat, there's the three little dots in the lower um, corner, uh, far right, and you can download it there. And uh, also I'll have them available if you join our mailing list, we'll uh, let you know there. So can everybody just have a fabulous day and let's keep the positive attitude that we really can uh, make the world work for all and uh, create the equal balance between fire and water and uh, all of these aspects that nature knows how to operate by and so we can learn as well so with that thank you